So welcome to Ideas That Matter. Uh, we are uh, have a special day today with Dave Weatherow. Um, Ideas That Matter is a series of events that uh, we're co-hosting with the Marsha Forest Center and Inclusion Press. And we're delighted about this co-creation. And really, I wanted to pass it to you, Kathy, who's the board chair of the Marshall Forest Center. Thank you very much. Um, I was thinking about this last night, um, um, that maybe it would be nice if I said something. Um, and I don't know who in the room knows the history of the Marsh Forest Center, but this is a nice moment for the center because we are now come full circle because we we started as the Center for Integrated Education and Community. We, from there, sprang the first Toronto Summer Institute. Um, then we became the March Forest Center and continued, of course, on with the Summer Institutes. And then um, ideas, then we had COVID, right, guys? And we had to sort of shut down the, the Summer Institute and we created, well, I didn't, but they did, Ideas That Matter. Oh, I'm there. And, um, the ideas that matter and now we're coming back in and we've been asked and we're very excited to be co-sponsors again with the ideas that matter presentations so this is a happy moment for the march force board and thank you and welcome to all that have come kathy and we certainly have some rituals and traditions to begin with a poem uh and yeah my, my friend jack and I know, I know, Dave, you're a big fan of Wendell Berry, so we picked a Wendell Berry mm -hmm. poem, one called The Real Work. Mm -hmm. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. We want to invite you to just settle in and take a long, slow inhale and an exhale and bring yourself home and fully present into this space and be centered in yourself and open to one another. And to add the inquiry, what would it be like if I had a little more ease in my being and hold curiosity? Thank you. And Jack, you get the honors of introducing Dave. Dave and I, I think, are official, officially old timers in this network. <laughs> We've been tinkering on the edges of trying to innovate for a little while. And I think you've actually got about five decades in, Dave. And you have quite a few stories to tell from that. Uh, <clears throat> I know many of them come from Winnipeg, where you were... Uh, an instigator in what has now come to be known as microboards and many innovations that follow. <laughs> More recently, <clears throat> you have gone through iterations following your love of sailing, and you have invented the Star Raft Project, which, uh, <clears throat> in my very simple synopsis, is yet another way to notice about the power of the circles and the relationships yeah. around. So, over to you, Dave. I said just before this started, only Jack and Linda could have convinced me to take 20 years of work, six hours of presentation, boil it down to an hour and 15 minutes, and add two things. So <laughs> that's, what we're, that's what we're doing today. Uh, I'm Dave Weatherow, uh, broadcasting from Vancouver Island. British Columbia on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish and Qualicum First Nations people. We've been working for uh, a very long time <clears throat> on a set of patterns for, for building powerful, 
circles of connection and companionship and opportunity for oneself or a friend or a loved one, but doing it one small step at a time so that it it is always achievable to do that one small step. Uh, years ago, we were doing some work and visiting the Niska people in the Nass Valley of British Columbia, the very far north. And one of the things they taught us was to start any important event by honoring your teachers. <clears throat> so today's teachers include the Niska people themselves and one man who returned home after having been away for many years. And I'll tell that story in a little while. They also include Jack Pierpoint, Marcia Forrest, John O'Brien, Linda Kahn, and Beth Mount, people who developed path and personal futures planning and solution circles and probably a hundred other tools for making progress in interesting times. Our friend, Judith Snow, my niece, Allie, who was the person who actually got me to pivot hard in the direction of circle building when she was born. Our daughter, Amber, our friends, Scott and Alan, and my 1950s neighbor, Tom Baker. And I usually say this at the end, but I'll say it at the beginning. If it wasn't for Tom Baker, we wouldn't be having this conversation because he changed my life when I was 19 years old and got thrown out of university and told never darken their doorstep again, came back into our neighborhood. And Tom created a little job for me in the printing company that he worked for in Denver. And that job led to the next and the next and the next and the next skill and the next possibility and a trajectory that ends up with all of us here. If Tom had not done that, my life would have been entirely different. Gosh knows where it would have ended up, but it wouldn't have been here. John McKnight, one of our great teachers. Dr. Joe Schaefer, who helped us understand some ways of getting through turbulent times and times of confusion or conflict without trying to dominate each other. A mom named Joan Loomis, tell her story in some detail. And the biologist, Margaret Wheatley, who got connected with our field quite some time ago and made the observation that the real disability seems to lie in a culture that doesn't know that we need each other. And she said, so when something or someone is failing to thrive, it's time to strengthen connections. It's time to focus our attention and time and energy on strengthening connections in contrast to folding towels or balancing your checkbook. And many other teachers, including everyone in this meeting, because everything that we've all worked out over the decades has come from parents and people with who live with interesting differences and people who are their allies and champions and have been their champions for a very, very long time. <clears throat> when we do the four week series, we introduce a step-by-step -step method for building a resilient action circle. We add a sailing metaphor that makes it fun and easy to remember how to do it. We share patterns for identifying and inviting and mobilizing people who can help. Introduce a step-by-step -step planning method that's based on path that the circle can fire up at any time, any moment. Share patterns for identifying and mobilizing the interests and gifts and capacities at the center. We talk about moving from activities and activity programming to a conscious focus on connection, companionship, and contribution finding and accessing what we've come to call the sweet places in community, sharing the work, staying safe in everything we do together, nourishing the circle so people feel valued and engaged and safe and committed for the long run and navigating through turbulent times. This is my favorite woodcut from Jules Verne's 20,000 uh, 20, Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, if you haven't 
felt like this one time or another or several times, you're uh, not noticing what's going on. <clears throat> and when we begin any journey, it always helps to start with a good map. And I've added that map, I've added a file uh, of that map into the chat. So if you go and find that file, uh, you can download it on your computer either uh, either right now or after we've uh, stopped the formal part of this and just started the chat. And here it's important to realize that each of us are standing between two maps, that families and people who experience disabilities and friends and neighbors and service providers are actually standing between two maps and those two maps have very different operating systems. It's like the difference between the PC operating system and the Macintosh operating system. The world of programs is very tightly bounded. That's what the boxes and triangles are about. And they're bounded by budgets and legislation and waiting lists and limitations. And they don't change very fast. They don't grow very fast. And there's a focus on deficiencies because that's how you get the ticket to the service system or to waivers or to services. And we end up in a kind of game of perpetual competitive misery to do that. The shoreline of community is inherently more abundant and it has a different operating system. It's based on invitation and invit introductions and agreements rather than eligibility. It's a doorway that, into what the scientist Stuart Kaufman describes as the adjacent possible. Kaufman says that, that this phrase captures both the limits and the creative potential of change and innovation. He said, in the case of prebiotic chemistry, the adjacent possible defines all of those molecular reactions that were directly available in the primordial soup. Sunflowers and mosquitoes and brains exist outside of that momentary circle of possibility. And the adjacent possible is a kind of shadow future, hovering on the edges of the present state of things, a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. And here's how. The strange and beautiful truth about the adjacent possible is that its boundaries grow as you explore them. Each new combination opens up the possibility of other new combinations. He said, think of it as a house that magically expands with each door you open. You begin in the room with four doors, each leading to a new room that you haven't visited yet. Once you open one of those doors and stroll into that room, three new doors appear, each leading to a brand new room that you couldn't have reached from your original starting point. Keep opening new doors and eventually you'll have built a palace. And there's one other new idea that we've discovered a while back, but it's uh, something that uh, bears thinking about. The shoreline of community offers many more degrees of freedom to try stuff out, to experiment, to explore, to take action. And the BC sailor, D. Clark, named her hand-built sailboat, TAS, deriving the acronym from Hakeem Bey's idea of a temporary autonomous zone. Clark speaks of Bey's idea as a defiant yet prudent response to overwhelming power, a mobile, elusive, contingent space that's not fought over like turf, but instead dissolves and reforms elsewhere, evading circlement, definition, and capture. And that's the way I've been thinking about the circles and how they actually work in real time. <clears throat> she continues, this seems to me to sum up the essence of the sailing life for a limited temporary period. The skipper of a small sailing craft is independent and free out in the water when the wind is fair, boat and skipper are briefly free of dependence on fossil fuels, the machineries of commerce and industry, free to set any course, free to live for a while outside the ubiquitous surveillance 
of nosy neighbors or state powers, powers. But such freedom is always temporary. Like life itself, eventually we have to return to a dock somewhere to find food, fresh water, tools and parks, fuel, and other products of the civilization we went sailing to get away from. The Taz concept seems to me to express elegantly all my mixed feelings about freedom and society, collectivity and individualism, resistance and cooperation. When we combine these two ideas, we create innovations and solutions to challenging problems in the moment that becomes what's possible. Just beyond your current state, the possibilities are closer than you think because the, the work on the community side of this equation is very fast moving, very quickly evolving. We get to tinker around and make mistakes, but also to find solutions very rapidly. We innovate to improve lives. And the people who wrote this said our approach is to take the uncommon path, think outside the box and find unique solutions. We know from experience that it's possible to forge a right relationship, a creative collaboration between the person and the family and the allies and these two maps. Now, all of us know that people thrive where they are known and loved, that sharing the places where we have standing opens the door to presence and participation, that on purpose allies can generate opportunities for contribution because they can invite us and introduce us into the places where they're making their contributions. And strong social networks demonstrably improve health and increase lifespan and watchful allies increase our safety and security. Uh, Jack knows this place. It's about a 10 minute drive and probably a 80 yards out from the shoreline where we live. And this is a rock wall that goes straight down 200 feet. And the ironclad rule of doing this kind of scuba diving is you never dive alone. In fact, you'll lose your ticket to get equipment if you try this dive alone, because if you get snagged up, you're a goner. There's nobody to save you. When you're diving together, you're always in a position to get helped out or to help somebody else out. So when someone we care about is at risk of isolation, perhaps even ourselves, it makes sense to invest time and energy into consciously strengthening connections. Now, it turns out that following this pattern doesn't take more time or involve more work. <clears throat> it involves a shift. It just allows us to be more effective in the time that we're already spending and expand our connections to an environment that's inherently more abundant and easier to navigate. The star raft kind of opens up the family circle. It's not opposed to or separate from the family circle, but it includes more people in the beautiful work that a family is already doing. But it also greatly expands communicate, community connections and opportunities. And the circle has the potential, potential to address every family's 3 a.m. question. We get night sweats over the question, who's going to be here for my loved one after I'm gone? But sometimes when we're thinking about making that first invitation, I know as a family member, our, we might wonder, where on earth do we find these people? And probably every family has felt at one time or another that they're living in that little white house, off that big promontory, and there's nobody else around. And for me, the answer to that question started with something that a mom named Joan Loomis taught me back in the early 1980s. We were working in Winnipeg and met Joan and she was thinking about her son Tom's future. And her vision, her hope was for him to find meaningful, fulfilling work when he got out of school. Tom was about 11 years old at the time. She knew he had 
six, seven, maybe eight years of the most school left. And her hope was that he would find meaningful, fulfilling work filled with interest and companionship and contribution and a sense of mastery and real mastery. And she realized that at that time, the traditional service system wasn't going to in generate the kind of future that she and her husband were envisioning for Tom, because at that time, it was all sheltered workshops and pre-employment programs and maintenance programs in the basements of grotty old hospitals. At least not in the short run, it wasn't going to change. And she was even more certain it was true because it was the year that 57 families marched on the legislature to lobby for more day program spots. And that was because 57 young adults had sort of aged out of school and everybody is at home watching daytime television, which is not good for your heart or your body or, or your spirit. And again, that, that stack of concrete boxes called the service system doesn't change things very quickly. In fact, I was in government and she said, whether well, you guys weren't counting these kids all the way up. But what that meant was that 57 families and more were spending a great deal of time facing the boundary with the service system, trying to get the government to do something different. But it also meant, this is even more important, that 57 sets of extended family members, neighbors, colleagues, church partners, and so on, had never had a chance to see themselves as an important part of the picture at a personal level. We had taught all these people to give to the United Way, to uh, put more bricks on the on, on the pile, but never to be a significant mover, shaker, and solution builder in individual lives. So all of these people, their gifts, their personal connections, and the places where they had standing influence and trust were effectively missing in action. Now, I follow a blogger whose name is Seth Godin, and he once said, our normal approach is likely to be useless here. If it's a new problem, perhaps it demands a new approach. If it's an old problem, it certainly does. It certainly demands a new approach. And Joan decided to take a new approach. And she started thinking about the little church that they attended in a working class neighborhood in Winnipeg. And when she thought about the people in her church, she remembered the nursery rhyme they used to say as kids. And we all learned it in second grade, regardless of what religion we come from. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. Joan was in my office and she wiggled her fingers. And she said, you know, David, everybody goes someplace during the week. And I, I said, Joan, what are you talking about? She says, well, Joe builds houses. And Harry works at the tractor plant and Mary volunteers at the art gallery, and Bill works at a printing plant, and they all already know Tom, and they all like him. And she also noticed that some people seem to be embedded in more extensive networks of connections because Joe belongs to the Rotary Club. He's connected to a lot of other local employers and engaged citizens, and these people know Joe and love him and trust him. Carla volunteers with Habitat for Humanity. So she's connected to other members of other faith communities and people with a wide range of other interests and business owners and creative, committed people. And Mary helps to organize the Folk Festival. By the way, I was showing this in Wisconsin about 15 years ago. And with the next slide, somebody said, whether oh, this is my life, <laughs> she's connected to the light and sound crew and artists and producers and musicians and stage crew and volunteers who love music. Now, I make a little observation here. Going to the folk festival is an enjoyable activity. It's a really lovely thing to do. Getting connected with the people who are putting on the folk festival and have done so for the last 61 years or 31 years gives you an opportunity to become part of the light and sound crew or become part of the stage crew or become part of, you know, one of the musicians, what people in the chorus. 
But this meant that the family, and we're going to draw back to one step at a time, could start with just a few people or even one person who already knew Tom. And by following their connections to people they already knew and places where they already had standing, they were just a step or two away from a lot of people and places that could come into play. By the way, every time you see a chart like this, it comes from about six weeks of thinking that we were doing and mapping that we were doing of who do we know, uh, what, what are their interests, what are their, what's their job, what's their, uh, what are their connections. And so these show up in a whole bunch of different ways. Now, it's important to remember that this is not about church. Uh, looking at this uh, set of pictures, there's a conversation cafe and a Toastmasters club and a drumming group and a Habitat build and a sailing club and an extended family. Every person in every one of these places is in a position to lend their connections to anyone else. So every thread we follow leads here to this galaxy of skills and capacities and workplaces and interests and associations and family and friends. So we take a deep breath and ask the question, whether, why are we talking about boats? In a blog post titled In Search of a Metaphor, the same Seth Godin said, you know, it seems to me that the best way to learn a complex idea is to find it living inside something else that you already understand. This is like that. So when you see a story, an example, a wonderment, take a moment to look for the metaphor inside. When we think about creating these support, personal support networks or circles, the image of a circle often comes to mind and the name circle often comes to mind. The idea is really important, but the image doesn't tell you very much in, about how to do the work, how to actually take the step-by-step -step process of putting it together. Albert Einstein once said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And we were pretty sure we needed an image that wasn't quite as simple as a circle. We've been looking for a pattern that had all the qualities that we were seeking for some time, the circle, the family, friendship, mentoring, it had an understandable method or sequence of steps for organizing and keeping going, a clear sense of direction, why we're doing this, and a metaphor that could help people understand the role, the different roles involved. And one year we were thinking about this and we were sailing on the Lake of the Woods and happened to get invited to join a star raft for an overnight anchorage. Now, I had no idea what that was, but everybody was receiving his little set of instructions. It occurred to us later that evening that the circle of people on a patio might be a lot like this circle of boats on the water. And here's why. <clears throat> when sailors aren't tied up at the dock, they usually anchor out at night or even at lunch with plenty of leeway. That's plenty of room between the boats so they don't crash into each other when, there, when there's changes in the wind or tides or currents. The, every sailboat pivots on its own anchor point. You have to be far enough away that you don't ding the other boats. But sailors use a different pattern when they want to anchor in community. And the origin of that pattern is lost in history. It's only written down in two places that I know of but somehow it circled the globe as experienced sailors shared the pattern and paid it forward over time. That's important, by the way. The sailing star raft is based on a nautical tradition of hospitality and keeping each other safe on the water. You actually learn that when you start to learn sailing. But also people sharing connections and what they carry on board and older sailors helping new sailors learn the ropes and noticing and practicing and making agreements on how to manage hazards up ahead and sharing information about the sweet places that we might visit on the lake 
and planning new adventures together. The Star Raft starts with an invitation, and it's built one boat, one person, one small conversation at a time. And the secret is that only one person needs to know how to do this, knows, needs to know how to build it. That person anchors out and then backs in toward the center of what's going to become a circle of boats. And when we talk about anchoring out, take a minute and think about where you are anchored in your community. Every single person is anchored in their own history, their own present set of relationships and workplaces and learning spaces or community groups or what Ray Oldenburg calls the great good places where everybody knows your name. Now think about what you carry on board because it's that tradition of sharing what we have on board. Every single person carries gifts and interests and values, skills, maybe some burning questions, contributions that they're making or would love to be making, maybe a unique culture, ideas, projects, dreams, and all of these are about to come into play. The builder invites another boat to anchor and imagine there's only one person who knew how to do this at the beginning. Builder invites another boat to anchor in the opposite direction then back in so the boats are nearly touching. And the two boats make stern ties with two little pieces of line. So the stern ties are pulling in, the anchor ties are pulling out. Everything wiggles for a while and finally settles down. But now all the places and relationships in which each boat is anchored and all the resources that each boat carries on board are potentially available to the people on the companion boat. I think that's how we all got here <laughs> with those kinds of invitations. Now the builder invites the third boat to join the raft by anchoring out in a different direction. <clears throat> and what we mean by different directions so we all have different histories and different connections backing in and tying up so the available resources multiply. The service system doesn't work that way. The service system has a certain number of resources. Those resources are always in competition with other things that government is dealing with. There's competition for them. There's usually a game of competitive misery going on at the, at the provincial or state level or national level. But here the available resources multiply as soon as the next boat comes in. Now, one of the people who's just joined the raft invites her friend to, jo to raft up. She gets on a little radio and she says, this is very, very cool. Uh, Mary, why don't you raft up with us? She teaches her friend how to anchor out back in and tie up. So now organizing and strengthening and sustaining the star raft is no longer the work of just one person. Everyone who's in the star raft knows how to start and build one. And so do you. And once you know it, you become one of the people who can start the next one. So we add more boats, it begins to look like this. This is 16 or so boats off of an island in Greece. It's a pattern you'll never forget. This one's in Chesapeake Bay. And here's something really interesting. The shape creates a space in the middle where it's safe to swim. It's safe to try stuff out. It's safe to explore. It's safe, safe to take risks because everyone's in view and everyone is always within reach. So when we help people build star raft circles, we do it in a way that keeps them conscious of seeing and supporting and encouraging one another, feeling accountable to the person at the center and to the group. They see the need for continuity, so they naturally keep adding new people. They have different interests and standing in different places. More opportunities show up. There are more people who share the work. And there's also an understandable for the different roles that people can play. If we had six hours, I'd go into all of these but I'll just make a distinction between the owner of a boat and the skipper of a boat. The owner of the boat gets to say where this is going, which in path terms is the person who is the center of the path. The skipper might be the owner. It might be somebody else who's 
responsible for helping to get us there and making sure that we're organized and stay safe along the way. By adjusting and tightening up on the stern lines, people can walk from one boat to another so now they can visit and share hospitality. And because all the anchors are grounded in different places, there's safety when the wind shifts. If we're not all just tied to the service system and the wind shifts on the service system, you know, and there's a government cutback of 30% across the board, we're all in trouble. But only some of us are tied to the service system solely. Uh, all of these boats, it's too big of a star raft off the coast of Scotland. I think they were going for a Guinness Book of World Records. All those boats are tied in the direction of the wind. And all the boats on the other side, when the wind shifts and turns around, are now tied in the direction of the wind so it doesn't collapse. And somebody who loses their anchor has time and help to get grounded again. Now, our friend Cindy Kernan reminds us, she says, David, don't wait until somebody is ready to leave. Keep working on a flow of new membership in the group. It's a primary source of creativity and energy. I remember Judith Snow one time saying she would go out into hotel lobbies and drag people in from the lobby to, to mix things up and to bring in new ideas, more creativity, more energy. But this way the star raft stays intact and strong when people leave and there's always space for newcomers. Now in his book, How Can I Help? The author Ram Dass made an important observation. He said, as far as he understood it, fear is the mind's reaction against the inherent generosity of the heart because the heart knows no bounds to its giving, the mind feels called upon to define limits. And uh, if we had time, I could tell you a story about somebody who came to his first board meeting and met a young man with some very significant vis visible differences and kind of freaked out. And I realized that Alan was in exactly that position. Joan remembered this and she decided that she would, uh, sorry, that she would be modest about the first question that she would ask so that she's not asking somebody to change their life or to make some kind of miraculous change in somebody else's life. She would be modest about the first question that she would ask. And she thought she would talk to Harry, the fellow who worked at the tractor plant. By the way, it's a real Harry, a real tractor plant and say, Harry, you've known Tom ever since he was little. You know how he lights up when he sees heavy equipment in action. The kid actually starts to vibrate. And we know that this is a big interest of yours. Our dream as a family, what we're thinking about is that together with friends, we might find ways for Tom to explore some workplaces that reflect his interests, which could open out into the possibility of a little internship or a bit of summer work or some weekend work or something like that, and maybe eventually a job. But we don't know where this might lead. We don't know what it might look like. But we wonder if you and Gwen would just come over to the house for coffee and just help us think about this for a while. And if you go away with anything from this session, go away with that question. We wonder if you and Gwen would come over to the house for coffee and just help us think about this for a while. Because I've asked that question probably close to a hundred times in a whole different set of circumstances. And nobody ever says no to it because they know that that's all they are being asked to do in the moment. And it's doable and they're being honored by that request. Joan also noticed when somebody is introduced in terms of disability first, it tends to brand the person and define the prospective relationship. One of the things that happens to parents, and I've been on the receiving end of this, is you get taught to portray yourself and your kid and your situation and your marriage in the most devastating terms possible in order to move ahead in the waiting list. 
But she also noticed that when someone's introduced in terms of their gift or their contribution, it changes the relationship, changes the possibilities. It's a different door. It sends a signal that we have something to offer and something in common. So instead of focusing on deficiencies, I mean, everybody knew that Tom had Down syndrome and a funny bump on his neck, and he's kind of easily led, and he feels isolated, and speech is hard to understand, et cetera. This is that practice that we've described as a game of competitive misery. And by the way, the chart, the uh, poster on the right was in my third grade classroom in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If I grow up, I want to be a fireman. And that kid never wanted to be a fireman. He was just a poster child for the March of Dimes. She decided to focus on Tom's gifts and skills and the things that he was most interested in. I want to work with machines. Hey, he's a great welcomer. It always stays really focused, especially in company. He appreciates art, he loves being outdoors. He enjoys music. He's fascinated by heavy equipment. And then she asked, if we follow the threads of Tom's interests, who would we most like to invite in the first instance? Who would we most like to involve? Well, Martha's part of a sailing co-op and Sarah volunteers at the folk festival. There's music. Carla organizes concerts. Alicia is a watershed engineer. Jan's a wildlife photographer. John's a working sculptor. Harry works at the tractor plant. Tom works at a printing plant. And Joan began making a map. This is the lowest tech mind mapping uh, approach that I've ever seen. It's a piece of paper and one color or two colors of magic markers of people she knew who shared Tom's interests and had standing in places where those interests were important. And she may, began making some concrete action plans for starting those conversations. Now, Tom's gifts and interests were very evident, but sometimes the gift is very subtle. In his book, Arctic Dreams, Barry Lopez writes, the naturalist Barry Lopez was writing about the people in the North and he says, there's a wisdom to be found in the people. And once in a great while, an Isumatok becomes apparent and Isumatok shows up in the community. And Lopez says that the word Isumatok is most often translated to mean a wise person or a wise man. But what it really means is a person in whose presence the collective wisdom of the community has an opportunity to reveal itself. Uh, I was hearing him at a time when I was close to Catherine and Nicola. And Catherine is somebody who is a great mystery. She has a set of disabilities as long as your arm. She doesn't speak and she doesn't move and she has had not at that time found any effective way to communicate. And if she swallows a grape sideways, she ends up in the hospital. And I realized when I heard Lopez say this, that that was who Catherine is. She created, she was the, the, the spark that created some of the most powerful inventions in our field over the last 30 years. And this collective wisdom includes experiences of discovery and intimacy and creativity and commitment. And people are delighted when those qualities rise to the surface. So this coming week, try making a little list or even a graphic of one or two people to whom you feel closest. What are their interests? What are their committed community affiliations? Where are they anchored? What are the workplaces and learning places? in the community uh, where they have standing, just as an exercise in beginning to get a grasp on the abundance that's available when we have that first conversation and invite one person to come and help you think about this. So thanks, Tom Baker. It'll be your first concrete action step in building your first circle. In week two, we talk about setting a good direction. And this is setting a good direction 
with the person at the very, very center and with the circle in play. <clears throat> Margaret Wheatley said about this, I've kind of noticed that people will truly support what they help to create. She said, it looks like you guys are creating a whole set of tools or have or using or have created a whole set of tools for thinking together and creating together and staying together. And that's important because people will really support what they help to think about, what they help to create. By the way, all these tools, path and essential lifestyle planning and personal futures planning and a number of others and um, community building patterns and circle building patterns operate within a sh similar shared framework of principles and values and understandings and ethics and what we've called an adaptive pattern language. If you think about 30 years ago, we weren't talking very much about people's gifts or contributions or gathering a circle or invitation or following the threads of people's interests. We weren't talking about um, facilitators position or stance of being in creative collaboration and respect and listening and inquiry. We're talking about, we were talking about checking all the boxes. Now the star raft direction always starts with a person's indication of direction. Every path does, every authentic person-centered plan does. And I have permission from Joe and his aunt or his niece to tell the, his story. We met Joe, one of the Southeastern United States. We were doing a big workshop, three-day workshop. People were busy on the second day uh, getting, you know, doing, getting their own path done, helping two other people do their paths. And um, Joe had drifted out of the room and then back in and everybody was busy with that. And he was sort of the odd person out. He came up to us and he said very, very quietly, had the quietest voice of anybody I've ever known, I, I'd like you to do my path. And so Joe pulled us together to do that. Um, and what Joe wanted to talk about was going to heaven. He said, I want my path to be that when I die, I go to heaven and I'm reunited with the people I love after a century of ills. And Faye was doing the inquiry, I was doing the drawing, and he told me very, very specifically what he wanted me to draw. He said, draw the cave where the stone was rolled away, draw three cro crosses because there were three crosses on the hill, uh, draw the rainbow because that was God's promise, draw two angels, uh, Joe actually picked the red marker out of my pack of markers and write, wrote J-E-S-U-E-S -E -E because Jesus is in heaven. And then he had me draw the city of, go of gold and um, the uh, pearly gates where St. Peter is welcoming him in. Now you notice that uh, those of you who do path notice that there's no circles and arrows and columns uh, I just had a feeling about Joe that if I, it was so tender that if I started with circles and arrows and columns, that that was going to be a distraction to him. <laughs> and he just needed to say what he needed to say. But then Faye asked him, Joe, this is wonderful. And, I th and, make, and she made sure that we got it all. And she said, how, how is it that you think about getting there? And he said, well, I belong to our, the Church of God in our community. It's a little log cabin church. And I'm reading and praying on my way to ordination. It was, it was a congregation where you didn't have to do eight years of seminary to become an ordained person. And I'm testifying. And then she said, who's helping you with that? Well, Don Hicks is my helper, teacher. Uh, Pastor Robert Ashley helps with that. And also I'm watching Billy Graham. He has a strong, uh, a strong example. Uh, Jane said, you know, 
also Joe has a quiet message. And one of the things that he does in our community, our small community, is Joe will sit with people who are sick and people who are dying as long as they need him to sit and pray with them. And he's a great blessing in our community. And so Joe created that. And then he indicated that he was done. That was what he wanted to say. Jane said afterwards, she said, thank you for giving me back my Uncle Joe. She said, I've always loved him. I've always cared for him and about him, but I didn't know what to do. Now I know what to do. Now I know how to help him strengthen those connections within the church, strengthen those connections with the, you know, with those uh, activities and those gifts that he's, you know, offering consistently and celebrate those things. I know what to do. Uh, people had finished their work in the big room. We'd gone into a small room because Joe was so quiet. And people started to drift in and hear the story and see the story about what happened. And this moment of happiness and embrace and celebration happened. I have a big picture of this up on my wall because I figure when we're doing person-centered planning, if it ends up looking like this, we know that we've been on the right track. About nine months later, we came back and Joe uh, came back actually wearing a three-piece suit. And he recruited these four women to do his earthly path. He said, I've done my heavenly path. And I want to do my earthly path. And this was the earthly path that they drew. Uh, his own little house, his garden, uh, working at the, at the store, uh, the local store, the neighbor kids coming and playing a basketball hoop in his front yard so the kids would come and play at his yard. The rainbow is still there. The Smoky Mountains are there. And again, once again, this was all he wanted to do. But Jane said, once again, now I know what to do when we get back home. I know the connections that I can help him make. When gathering the circle for any occasion, remember two things. One is that diversity works. The more diverse the circle is in terms of gender and status and ethnicity and maybe language or viewpoints or age or culture or experience, the richer the set of possibilities uh, will open up in that conversation. And when communication is a challenge, you know, if somebody like Catherine doesn't, quote, doesn't communicate at all, of course, Catherine communicates a lot if you know what to watch for. Or somebody has very uh, disturbing, very challenging forms of communication. Or somebody communicates in ways that aren't, are significant but not really understandable. The key lies in the circle a creative assembly of people who know you and love you and have been listening to you for some time. And you might do some work ahead of time so the person has some extra time to think about and prepare their communication. We were doing a path for an art co-op in one of the central United States. And uh, this was a co-op that was about to include three or four authentic artists, as they describe them, who happen to have significant disabilities. And when it came Antonio's time to talk about his addition to the vision statement, he stood up and he started to talk and they were all English words, but they didn't quite hang together. And Faye had the uh, intuition to hand him the, st the stack of magic markers. And this is what Antonio drew. Uh, it starts in 1989, where he's indicating, and he's writing, I'm surrounded by lonely people, negative people, lack people. But I had this encounter. And that encounter gave me 
strength and goal and talent and energy. And I started to emerge and become seen as a homo sapien artist object by 1996. People saw me as a man, people saw me as an actual object or as an actual artist. And then he did the little vision part, his vision part for the co-op, which was, this is where the art museum was born on 1266. And 18 years later in 2001, the art museum is going to be look like this. <laughs> You know, bigger, more buildings, but still that thing at the center. We receive what's available in the moment, and sometimes what's available in the moment is a little miracle. We learned from Jack and Marcia and Linda and John and Beth and other people that this is not an IEP or an IPP or an ISP. It's an expression of the person's largest hope and of our largest hope. But once we get that, it's possible to derive a service plan or a program plan or an education plan that reflects and honors that vision. But it puts us in balance with the service system because the people are saying we can help by doing this. And the service system says we can help by doing this. There's power in gathering the circle. More ideas, more opportunities, people can pitch in. Person can invite others to share their hopes and dreams for him or her. But the person also gets to say what he or she wants on her statement of direction. Yes, I like that, or thanks, I hear you, but I don't wanna go in that direction. I'm gonna give you an example of that in a few minutes. Families remind us, you know, we talk about person-centered, person-centered, but families remind us that it's legitimate for us to carry dreams for each other. We do that all the time. We carry dreams for our sons and daughters, for our parents, for our good friends. And there's that extended family pattern of deep knowing and trust and belonging, building bridges to trusted relationships and announcing and interpreting and celebrating and recognizing the person's gifts and intimacy and encouragement. But hearing the dreams of others, again, if a person can say, I like that, or thanks, I hear you, but I don't wanna go in that direction, clarifies what we are coming into an agreement about what we will do together. Now, circle members might say, yes, we get that, and we can help with that, and here's how. Or we hear you, but we can't figure out how to help you with that right now, but we will keep thinking about it. It goes up on the paper in words and images. Or sorrow, but, sorry, but we can't or even won't help you do that, and here's why. That one came from the, actually the same visit uh, that we were doing with the art co-op. We were doing a workshop the day after, and there were three guys who came who worked in the same group home and refused to get their own paths done. They didn't want to be vulnerable that way. And they turned to me, I was in the back of the room, and they said, Withero, could we use this to plan a bank robbery? And I thought for a minute, and I said, yeah, strictly speaking, you could use the form to plan a bank robbery. What's the vision? You know, what's, what's the positive possible future? Where do, where do we start? Who do we need to enroll? Well, me to enroll a guy with a Tommy gun and a getaway car, but we won't help you do that. And here's why. And Michael Small reminds us that we, when we pay attention to what's important to and what's important for the person, we may also need to build some agreements about major safeties in the work that we're doing together. So I get to tell a story I have permission to tell the story, but not to show faces yet. This was a number of years ago. And one man in this picture who had been bounced from one institution to another, one group home to another, one foster, you know, uh, you know, shared family living arrangement to another, always ended up homeless when things came unraveled, said, I want my own house. Real, my own land. I want to be able to welcome people and my helpers into my house. 
I want to plant a garden. I want to be married. I want to find love. I want to keep sailing. Uh, I want to be safe. I want, and this is the six o'clock position out of, out of the picture, but I want a, a circle of people. And after he had said this and signed it because he was a signing person, he invited the other people in the room to say what they were hoping for him, how they saw him, what they were dreaming about on his behalf. But he also knew that he had the, the standing to say, yes, I, that's great. I want that. No, I don't want that. So this was a kind of larger picture that evolved. This gift is lifelong learning for all of us, a stable life. People only change one at a time, a team approach that what we are doing together is in a spirit of companionship because it has been pretty conflicted. And at one point, somebody made a proposition, and I don't even remember what the proposition was. It's at the 10 o'clock position here. He said, no, I don't want that on my path. I want to go forward. I don't want to go back. Once that picture was complete and people, and he felt it was complete and people felt it was complete, we moved into a two-year time frame and did a positive possible future. And we did it this way. I was doing the drawing by this point. He said, by Christmas of 2003, I bought the house. And I drew a house and an exclamation point. And because I was doing the drawing, I was able to turn to him and say, Michael, that's great. How did that happen? What made that possible? And he kind of cranked a knuckle into his temple for a while. And then he signed, I don't know. I can't remember. And I said, could we ask the other people? And he said, sure. One after another, people talked about what they did to make that possible. I leveraged money from the trust fund left in his mother's uh, estate as the down payment. The guy who was head of the mental health region said, I made a policy decision that he could use gain money at work and a strong circle to pay off the mortgage. Somebody said, I introduced him to my best friend who is the loans manager at the local credit union. And by the way, 15 of us stood with him when he applied for his mortgage so that he would know that this was a solid deal. Somebody said, I baked pie. I, or I kept organizing potlucks and music and food. And one after another, things these things showed up and people figured out in the moment what made that possible and how they helped. At the 11 o'clock position, he says, I met someone who signs or learns to. And that was one where, first of all, we said, we're not sure that we can deliver that, but we can make sure that we you know, uh, don't blockade it, but also thinking in terms of helping you spend time in places where your contribution is valued, where your, uh, your gifts are valued, where your spirit is valued. It's a higher likelihood that you're gonna meet, meet someone and it could end up in a romantic relationship or just a deep friendship. So all that detail happened. Uh, this is actually from a different path, but it just illustrates, you get a snapshot of now, including the resources that are represented now by the circle, but also the challenges, the difficulties out of that. Who do we need to enroll? Why? How do we stay strong and focused as a circle? What are our practices to do that? And you end up every path and every circle meeting getting a first step from every single person in the room. And when that happens, it's helpful, by the way, to help somebody get down to brass tacks. Learn this in Alberta. Uh, one man was getting his path done publicly as an example. 
And uh, it was great till he got to the point of first steps and he stopped and he said, I can't do any of this until I achieve inner peace. And I was doing the drawing, so I drew an innerly peaceful person and said, Jack, that's great. What's your first step in achieving inner peace? And he thought for about 90 seconds and he said, I need to make peace with my son. I said, that's terrific. What's the first step in making peace with your son? And he said, I'm going to call Bill tonight. And he did. And he came back the next day and the guy was just glowing. So start this conversation. What are you hoping for? What are you yearning for? What are you thinking about? What do you love with the person that you're caring about? And it's the next concrete action step in building that circle. In week three, we talk about taking the helm. Uh, this is uh, a set of things that we always have in hand at any given moment. You know, we don't have to wait for the next waiver to come along or for the next uh, annual or semi-annual or tri-monthly plan session to come along. There's things that we can do in the moment. Taking the helm on a sailboat means literally you're making micro adjustments from moment to moment. One of our great teachers, John McKnight, once said something that changed our way of thinking. He said, a great community is one that systematically identifies and mobilizes the gifts of every single one of its members. And we looked for years to find one and realized that, that we kept coming to places that didn't understand that that was their job until we met the Niska people. They have a tradition of identifying where every single person has standing and responsibility and, and gifts that they can bring to the community. And one part of that practice is a ceremony that's held when a baby's about six months old. The maternal uncle on the right-hand side holds up the baby and declares where that baby, first of all, what their name is, who their family is, what that baby has standing in family, a collection of families called a house, a collection of houses called a clan, a collection of clans called a tribe, and a whelp, in fact, two whelps. Every single person in this community has a circle, a whelp, a circle of people who care for them, care about them, help them move forward. And every single person is actually on somebody else's or several other people's circles. And they also have whelps for the trees and the salmon and the economics of the community. But they describe that, and this is what this child is destined in that matrix, in that structure to do. The other part of that is uh, that they keep an eye out for the times when a child's eyes light up and they follow that trajectory in the direction of connecting that child with people who are doing that kind of work or that kind of art or that kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of uh, endeavor. By the way, these folks are all dressed in traditional regalia. They were clear to us that this is not about fashion or, and not about art and not about decoration. These are the symbols that each person is wearing about where they have standing in family, clan, tribe, uh, whelp. And the little girl in the lower left-hand corner has a killer whale emblem on the uh, cloak that she's wearing. And that can only mean one thing, which is she's part of the killer whale clan and the killer whale clan has certain things to do. Well, Faye was doing the drawing on this. They would have tell her how to draw it uh, what the long Niska word was, and then they would talk together and figure out how to translate it into English. And the English word for this was every single person has a purpose. And it's our job to figure out what that purpose is. 
So some communities have really strong patterns for remembering how to do this. It actually shows up in many Aboriginal communities. We need to practice it till we learn it again. And we think we found a relatively simple formula for releasing this energy, and it's this. Systematically follow the thread of a person's gift, their interest, their capacity, or even their burning question in the direction of companionship and connection and contribution. Now that's different than following the thread in the direction of the next human service program or the next plea that you're making or argument that you're making with the government. Who are the people, as Judith Snow says, where are the people and the places in the community? And by community, we're talking about not a, uh, you know, not a location, but, but the togetherness of people where that makes sense. And it turns out that the places where our interests and contributions intersect are extraordinarily powerful connectors. Where were you when you met your best friend? Where did you meet the person you love? Where did you meet an ally, perhaps, who changed the direction of your life? Turns out that people almost always discover friendship and commitment in the course of doing something else together, something that can serve as a conductor long enough for a, for a relationship to grow at its own pace. And here's one example from our own journey where I wish I'd had more time. Amber passed away in 2004, but when she was with us, uh, one of the things that happened was that the banana slugs were eating the tomato plants in our garden. We live on the edge of a rainforest. And I was ready to commit nuclear warfare in the backyard with the heaviest duty banana slug killer that I could find. But she had grown up in a different era with an eye towards being gentle with the environment. And she gave us a look. And the look meant we need to, she, that she wanted to talk about it. And that particular expression meant we need to talk about it now because I don't have any way of reminding you to talk about it later. And we did 20 questions. Now, we could have missed the signal or ignored the signal or let the slugs eat the tomato plants and just sort of gone into the patronizing uh, oh honey mode or run a Google search and come up with a more earth friendly solution, which is what we did. And you make a bucket of eggshells and fireplace ashes and make a little circle of eggshells and fireplace ashes around the base of each tomato plant. And the slugs don't like to cross that because it gets stuck to their tummies. And they will go next door and eat the neighbor's tomato plants. But where could this have gone? If we'd had the time to follow the threads of her interest and find the places where she could have made her unique contribution. But also if I had known to do that, these days it's pretty easy to find people and local groups involved in earth-friendly agriculture and organic gardening. The English River, Englishman River Watershed Conservation Society is a regional effort to protect the water from heavy metals and oils and poisons and things like that as it flows down the river into the estuary. And in our neighborhood, there's a small group called the Mid-Vancouver Island Habitat Enhancement Society. And these lovely people go down and move rocks around and help uh, clear the way for salmon to come up river and spawn and dig out invasive plant species. And one of our neighbors, is a very active member of that. And if we'd known then what we know now, and if it had been at the right time, we could have asked Jeanette to introduce Amber and us to this group. And she becomes the person who's sort of the emissary into that group and figure out together, think together about what Amber's contribution could be, how she would make that contribution. And in that context, she's understood of one, as one of us and not somebody with a disability. And remember, any one of those people could become a friend or an ally who knows the story, gets to know her well, could be invited into the star raft circle. Once again, it's helpful to remember that this can start anywhere with one person, one place, 
and follow just one thread. Because every person in every one of these places can lend their connections to anyone else. Every thread we follow leads here. When we find or create these places and share the dream and offer our contribution, we tap into an abundance of interests and skills and workplaces. These are all real and associations and trustworthy connections because safety is an important topic for all of us. Joe, the house builder, knows everybody in the construction industry and the hospitality industry in our region. And Joe knows who can be trusted and who should never be trusted in those endeavors. And he's got clout. Joe is a loved and very well-respected person. Feels like something we began to experience on the Lake of the Woods. If it was a single body of water or a circle, it would have a shoreline measuring 240 miles long, but there are 14,572 islands on the lake. Jack has gone sailing with us on that lake. There's 65,000 miles of shoreline. And to navigate that lake, we have to zoom in on the map. Now, somewhere in that 65,000 miles, there's a place called Yellow Girl Bay. It's a good place to anchor at night because it's protected by high banks and a narrow entrance. And it turns out there's a tradition of rafting up there at sunset. And the map doesn't tell you there's that tradition, but you find out about that by invitation. Yellow Girl Bay might be described as one of the sweet places on the lake. And it turns out there's a secret to identifying the sweet places on the lake and the sweet places in community. They tend to be small and intimate. They're traditions of welcome. They're based on cooperation rather than competition. And they systematically identify and mobilize people's gifts and contributions. If you've ever been on a habitat build, you've been there. And you don't find them by looking at the navigational chart, you find them by invitation, by paying attention to the lore of the place. And you find welcome by creating a relationship or strengthening a relationship with someone in that place who already has standing and influence, a kind of harbor pilot. So remember, there are many things that we can always do in the moment, regardless of how you keep time. Set a good direction, share the dream. We can always ask people to do very specific things and remember that people are just waiting to be asked. Introduce us to people you already know. Serve as a connector to the places where you already have standing. Engage people who have lots of connections. That's just about everybody. Follow networks of trust and make concrete agreements on how we will ensure major safeties in the work that we're doing together. When we have more time, we get into uh, very clear detail about that. Identify and mobilize the gifts of the person at the center. Follow the threads of the person's interests in connection and companionship and contribution. Find the sweet places in the community. Listen deeply. The Chinese character for listening is eyes, ears, heart, undivided attention, and a symbol for royalty, which means paying the kind of deference and respect that you would pay to someone of royalty. Be in relationship, it's not committee work. You become part of the person's life and welcome him as part of yours. Make an agreement to be tied in for a while. Bring other trustworthy people into the picture. People can do that in a moment. Pay attention to continuity, share the work. We talk about the eight nautical roles. And remember that this is all done just one tiny step at a time, as Stephen Covey calls it, at the speed of trust. So start this conversation with the person you care about and with the people who already care about you and your family member. It'll be the next concrete action step. So we do a session on staying the course, <laughs> commitment, continuity, the gentle art of hosting, and 
the very gentle art of getting through turbulent times. One idea is to pay attention to hospitality and set and setting. This place puts people's heads and hearts into a totally different location than this space. So always use personal space or community space. Our friend Pete says, it can't just be about me. So without losing focus on the commitment to the person at the center, the patterns and connections can eventually uphold everyone who is tied in. And every once in a while, make a practice of doing something like solution circles to help one person after another in the circle get solution to a problem. Generate conversations that keep people coming back. Uh, Judas says, on every occasion, we might want to share something about the dream. Ask where are the places where that can take root? Who might be able to help? What resources do we have or don't have yet? That, that might help and what are our next steps? And don't forget to celebrate. In terms of navigating in turbulent times, of times of being stuck, times of the doldrums, times of confusion, and times of conflict, there's a handful of tools that we share in week four, including force field analysis, looking at the driving forces and the restraining forces, and getting an understanding of that, and then doing everything that we can to push the driving forces upwards. When we find ourselves in irons, uh, we've been heading too far, too close to the wind, too close to one singular goal for too long. And the sail slacks and we're getting driven backwards. There's a trick for getting out of irons. The solution circles coming from Jack and Linda and the other people at Inclusion Press about getting unstuck and Joe Schaefer's pattern for helping people cross a bridge together into a new world when there is deep, sustained, harmful conflict. So really quickly, what we're working on now is we have a charitable nonprofit that's a, like a home base for the work. And our mission is really simple. We want to provide the supports and the training for doing this free for families forever. We run month long learning and action trainings. And one of the things that we'll do with uh, Jack and Linda and Kathy is get an invitation out to you that you can either come in January or share with other people and or share with other people. We're building a card deck. You've seen some of them on the fly. It can serve as a facilitation and meeting tool we're supporting people with online alumni meetings and deep dive circle coaching, helping provider agencies and direct support workers incorporate these patterns and strategy into their day-to-day -day work. It makes direct support a lot more interesting. And end with a few final words from our First Nations neighbors in Canada and the United States. And his book, The Truth About Stories, Thomas King, the Canadian First Nations writer says, knowing the facts, the opportunity, or even the process is merely a first step. Don't say in years to come that you would have lived your life differently if only you'd heard this story. You've heard it now. And one more set of words in terms of when to take action and in what spirit to take action. I hope the elder speaks. You have been telling people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour and there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden, you know, know your source of sustenance. It's time to speak your truth, create your community, be good to each other, and do not look outside yourself for the leader because that's one of the things that puts everything on hold for a very, very long time. And he clasped his hands together and smiled and said, this could be a good time. There's a river flowing now very fast. It's so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are torn apart and suffer greatly. But know that the river has its destinations. 
The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above water. And I say, see who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we're to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time for the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we have been waiting for. This has been attributed to an unnamed Hopi elder. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but it sure makes sense to me. I'm just gonna tell you one more story that I hope will encourage you a bit. Uh, we started, first of all, we've been doing this for about 15 years. A couple of years ago, we started supporting a young woman and her mom to reconvene their circle uh, because they were stuck 93 minute drive away from everything that was meaningful to them. Uh, she had been, the young woman had been moved to an independent living apartment and an independent living program where she learned to balance her checkbook. And once she checked all the boxes, they went away and she's stuck in the apartment. And then she got a hip problem and uh, that she couldn't get up, she couldn't stand up, she couldn't shower, she couldn't transfer in and out of her bed and her wheelchair. So her mom came to live with her and we helped them rebuild their circle. Conducted a path that was partly in-house and partly online because there were people who needed to be there online. We have a practice, by the way, of starting every meeting with remembering why we're here, the gifts, that the person brings that North Star direction and celebrating the done list at every meeting and ending every meeting with the next steps list, getting a new next steps list from everybody in the room. These people moved six major items. This is an application called Trello where you can actually grab one and move it from one stack to another. They moved six major mobility items from the next steps list to the done list in the first three weeks. They moved 27 items from the next steps list to the done list in three months. It's been just under two years and they've moved 67 items from the next steps list to the done list around major, major uh, support, transportation, communication, contribution, poetry, uh, political involvement. She really wanted to get back on the, on the uh, platform committee of her uh, chosen political party, 67 items. So we know not only in that story, but in many other stories, things get done that they're you know, there are times of difficulty, there are times of challenge, there are things when, times when things threaten to come unraveled or do come unraveled. One last little anecdote, but it's absolutely real. Mom and dad from a third world country, new immigrants um, needed to build their circle. Dad's an engineer at a big electronics thing. Uh, daughter has very substantial and very challenging disabilities. Uh, they wanted to build a circle around finding good direct support workers. And once we had gone through that process of helping them bring in one person after another, starting with their next door neighbor, they expanded the search party for good direct support workers and had that solved in about three weeks flat. Uh, we were in the at the end of a meeting about eight months later, getting next steps, and everybody said their next step. And finally, it was mom's turn. And you know, I could see her husband's hand go to her shoulder to comfort her because she had to say, my next step is I have to take a step back. 
I've just received a diagnosis of very, very advanced breast cancer, and I'm going in for major surgery on Thursday, and I can't do anything. I'm not going to be able to do anything for you know, recovering from surgery and chemo and radiation surgery. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to be of much help here. What happened was in the instant, and you know that what happened is that the whole circle jumped in and said, my dear, this is your circle as much as it is your daughter's, and we know how to help with that. And they did. And by the way, she's recovering. She's got her hair back and her life back. But it really took the circle to do that. So, you know, there are times when things get uh, pretty pretty hairy out there. Okay, I'm so I'm going to unspotlight myself. It worked. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Dave. That was an amazing synthesis of six hours and 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> right.